Meine Damen und Herren, seien Sie herzlich willkommen in der Pinakothek der Moderne. In der Rotunde, in der es eine großartige Installation gibt von Anish Kapoor. Wir, die vier Direktoren und Direktorinnen des Hauses, haben vor Jahren beschlossen, wir machen regelmäßig ein Projekt in dieser Architektur, die so einzigartig ist und sich nur mit Schinkels altem Museum in Berlin vergleichen lässt. Wir machen Projekte mit Künstlern. Anish Kapoor aus Indien, in London lebend, haben wir eingeladen und im Laufe eines etwa zwei Jahre dauernden Gesprächs gemeinsam entwickelt, was hier geschieht. Und jetzt sehen wir das Ergebnis. Eine gigantische Skulptur, ein großer Ballon, der die Architektur zu sprengen scheint, der den Raum besetzt mit Intensität, mit Leidenschaft, ergreift und den Menschen klein macht und damit das Staunen wiederum groß macht. Eine Installation, die sich durch die drei Etagen der Rotunde durchzieht, eine gigantische Kugel. Vielleicht kennen Sie von Boulet das Architekturmodell, die Idee, in der Zeit der Französischen Revolution ein Kugelhaus zu bauen. Die Kugel ist die einfachste Form. Und für uns war das das Einfachste, diese unendlich schwere Aufgabe, die Kugel in dieses Gebäude zu bringen, diese unendlich schwere Aufgabe gemeinsam zu entwickeln. Gemeinsam mit dem Künstler Anish Kapoor in seinem Studio, dem ich sehr herzlich danke. Wir haben miteinander ein Unternehmen gestartet, den Raum zu erfahren, der von der Kugel eingenommen wird. Die Wirkung des Raumes, die Wirkung des nicht sichtbaren Raumes, oder die Wirkung eines dunklen, schweren Volumens, was im Raum schwebt. Sie merken, viele Erfahrungshorizonte tun sich auf. Dass das möglich war, ist nicht nur dem Künstler zu danken, sondern vielen Beteiligten. Zuallererst natürlich seinem Studio. Natürlich auch den Direktorinnen und Direktoren des Hauses. Vor allem dem Team, die sich, das sich zusammensetzte aus den Museums- und Ausstellungstechnikern des Museums selbst und den helfenden Händen vom Studio Kapur und Dritten. Es war, was heute so leicht und einfach ausschaut, ein großer Akt. Über Nacht, zwei Tage lang, das aufzutragen zum Volumen und einzupassen in der feinsten Axialsymmetrie im Raum. Ein Raum, der nicht so hätte besetzt werden können, wenn uns nicht jenseits der technischen Hilfen und der künstlerischen Idee und der kuratorischen Durchführung durch Oliver Kase, für die ich sehr herzlich danke, noch monetäre, finanzielle Hilfe zuteil geworden wäre. PIN, Freunde der Pinakothek der Moderne, war wieder einmal bei uns an unserer Seite und hat einen erheblichen Anteil geleistet. Weitere Sponsoren sind zu nennen. Die Themik Stiftung wird das im Jahre 2021 hierzu stattfindende Beiprogramm unterstützen. Wir brauchen viele, die helfen und wir wissen, dass so eine faszinierende Installation für Jahre, vielleicht für Jahrzehnte in Erinnerung bleiben wird. Darüber sind wir sehr glücklich. Es ist eine einzigartige Erfahrung, diesen Raum so zu sehen. Wir sind darüber sehr glücklich, weil die Gespräche auch mit Herrn Klüser von der Galerie uns über Jahre beschäftigt haben. Eine Geburt eines solchen großen Kindes ist nicht einfach, aber am Ende zählt das Ergebnis. Und darüber sind wir allen Genannten dankbar. Nicht zuletzt natürlich dem Bayerischen Ministerium für Wissenschaft und Kunst, dass sie die Mittel für solche Projekte bereitstellen, die wir dann komplementär ergänzen. Und so freut es mich ganz besonders, heute hier und jetzt den Staatsminister Bernd Siebler an unserer Seite zu wissen. Und ich leite über zu seinen Worten und sage auch ihm Dank. Dank zuletzt aber an ähm, Oliver Kase für die Kuratierung dieser großen Unternehmung und an Anish Kapoor und sein Team. Ich wünsche viel Freude und starke Eindrücke am Abend der Eröffnung wie auch in den Wochen und Monaten danach. Es wird lange da sein, es wird stark wirken und hoffentlich unvergessbar sein.
Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, liebe Freunde der Pinakothek der Moderne und des Saturnenprojektes, Made to Measure. Das ist der Anspruch, den wir heute einmal mehr erleben, nämlich ein Kunstwerk, das maßgefertigt ist für die Rotunde hier in dieser wunderbaren Pinakothek der Moderne. Anish Kapoor knüpft damit mit seiner Skulptur an ein schon sehr erfolgreiches Projektbild an, nämlich die erste Installation Pendulum des leider viel zu früh verstorbenen Lichtdesigners Ingo Maurer. Schon damals haben alle Besucherinnen und Besucher gesagt, genau das hat gefehlt, warum war das eigentlich nicht schon viel, viel früher, da ist das Pendel. Und genauso wird es sein mit der Skulptur von Anish Kapoor, der hier jetzt auch in einen Dialog mit den Menschen, die die Pinakothek besuchen, tritt, mit der Architektur, mit dieser wunderbaren Rotunde. Und ähm, das ist genau das, was ich mir wünsche. Dialog, Austausch, das Kunst und Kultur, die Menschen dazu bewegen, aufeinander zuzugehen, zu diskutieren, sich auch mal zu streiten, wenn einem etwas nicht gefällt, wenn man etwas nicht versteht oder wenn man schlicht anderer Meinung ist. Also ein höchst demokratischer Prozess. Deshalb möchte ich mich ganz, ganz herzlich bedanken, zum einen bei Anish Kapoor, dass er wieder zurück ist hier in München, nach der Ausstellung 2007 im Haus der Kunst, aber natürlich auch beim Kurator Dr. Oliver Kase, der den Künstler gewonnen hat, das ganze Team der Pinger Kothek und natürlich bei Bernhard Marz, unserem Generaldirektor. Und jetzt gute Gespräche und lassen Sie die Skulptur auf sich wirken. Herzlichst, Ihr Ben Siebler. Herzlich willkommen, meine Damen und Herren. Ähm im Siemens Auditorium zu dieser Installation von der neuen Skulptur von Anish Kapoor Haul, der Beitrag der Sammlung Moderne Kunst zu den Rotundenprojekten in der Pinakothek der Moderne. I'd like to continue in English now because as you know we are sending this uh, media conference live on YouTube and this is why I, I warmly like to welcome the audience watching us via live stream on YouTube. Um, you can, uh, you are invited to leave your questions in the in the comment section of the live stream, so I can pick up them later um, in the conversation with Anish Kapoor and the media representatives that are present in this auditorium. Before starting uh, the artist talk with Anish Kapoor, please allow me some um, opening remarks because today. Is, is really a very special day for the Pinacothek. On the day exactly 18 years ago, this museum, the Pinacothek de Moderne, was open to the public. A lot of beautiful and interesting projects took place, of course, in here and take place, but uh, I take the liberty to say no one comparable to this sculpture by Anish Kapoor. Uh, it's a very big object, of course, Uh, the biggest object ever displayed uh, in this museum, but a very subtle and a very delicate one uh, at the same time. When the Rotunda projects were started by the four museums under this roof, I thought that Anish Kapoor would be the ideal artist to work in here and create a site-specific sculpture. It was by coincidence that we met in in uh, in. May, I think, 2018 at, at Listen in, in London and spoke about these projects um, first. Uh, and then during Anish Kapoor's exhibition at uh, Galerie Bernd Klüser in Munich in November 18, um, we had the chance to visit the site together. Uh, and I'd really like to thank Bernd Klüser for, for the support for this project. Then came, we all know, COVID-19 with all these lockdowns and limitations. Um, and we have three countries involved in the production and planning of this uh, sculpture. So uh, we continue to work together um, as hard as we could and uh, are happy to have it now realized with about four months uh, of delay. You can imagine that working with Anish Kapoor is, is is always about testing limits, uh, testing limits of form, limits of space, uh, limits of language also when describing this, this work of art. Uh, having this sculpture installed, of course, is uh, the result of a great teamwork, I have to say. First and foremost, the team of the studio. Uh, it was a great pleasure to work with the studio directors, uh, Lucy Adams, Peter Lynch, 
And I'd especially like to thank Peter Lynch, who's in the auditorium. He's here since Friday and basically worked um, all night and all day to, to, um, to install this sculpture in, in the best manner. Thank you, David, for this. Um, teamwork means also the wonderful team at the Sammlung Moderne Kunst. And I'd like to, um, to name in first place Wolfgang Vastian, uh, the head of museum technology and exhibition technology for his uh, ingenious construction ideas and the very smooth and concentrated installation of the sculpture. So my warmest thanks to Wolfgang and also to all colleagues who prepared this media conference on all levels. Nothing would happen, of course, without the great donors we have in Munich. Uh, I would like to thank our friends PIN uh, for their extensive support and also the Herbert Schuchardt Stiftung in Munich. So from today on, you can see Anish Kapoor's sculpture titled Howl here, a mysterious form, let's say resembling a sphere made of a dark red PVC material filled with air, hovering in the rotunda at the same time, um, pressing against the pillows of the building. The sculpture is not only a masterpiece of artistic vision, but it's also a masterpiece of precise engineering, uh, exact to the centimeter. I'm sure that this installation will challenge the viewer's perception of the space, and our experience within the space. Anish Kapoor's installation continues his exploration of symbiotic relationships between architecture and sculpture. So 18 years after the opening of the Pinacotec, this object in the, so to say, grown-up museum uh, is an invitation to rediscover this building on all the three floors uh, from distance, from close-up, during different light situations and also uh, during different seasons. So I'd really like to uh, invite you to come and see and, and find out by yourself how this sculpture um, um, is in the building and how, how you can um, personally react to it. This is now the point where I would like to start my conversation with Anish Kapoor. Um, let's see, I mean, you're all, I can, I, I have you on the screen all the time, Anish. Hello again. Hello, hello, hello. So now we hello. hear you too. Great. So, Great. Um, um, Anish, as I said, we are sitting in the Pinacotheque de Moderne. Your sculpture is here. It's very present in this building, uh, mm -hmm. present and alive, so to speak. But unfortunately, uh, you are not with us personally. Um, nevertheless, we have full uh, understanding that you do absolutely don't want to enter an airplane at the moment. All the better that you agreed to have this live artist talk about your work. We really appreciate that. So, well, thank you, and uh, I'm sorry not to be with you. Truly, I don't think I've ever opened a work without being physically present. Mm -hmm. um, so that makes me sad. But uh, such are the such perhaps are the times we live in. So are we, but at least we we can chat um, about it. So my yeah. my first question, of course, is. Where are you now? We see bookshelves uh, behind you with interesting books we studied already. How are you mm -hmm. and how have you been in the last difficult months of this COVID-19 um, disease? I'm, I'm in my studio, uh, not the space where I, which I work in, but a little, a little office. Uh, this is my library behind me or some of my library behind me. Um, And um, the last months have been interesting. They've been um, slow, contemplative, um, reflective. But, you know, I'm a very much a studio-based artist. I do not believe in the idea of um, have an idea, you know, the, the concept of have an idea and go out and make it. 
Um, it's as if the studio studio process generates in its own slow pace what must be done next. Um, and I mean, I've often said I have nothing to say. I talk too much, but I have nothing to say as an artist. Um, and I want that, to, and I keep reminding myself of it, um, that it's out of the studio process that things emerge. And in that, it's my job then to watch really carefully what emerges and allow it to have, to come into meaning. Not, I have nothing to say. I have no meaning to give you but to come into me, to belong, to slowly emerge um, as hopefully a meaningful, meaningful thing. Sometimes it doesn't happen, of course. I mean, often it doesn't happen. And that's part of the deal. So what I don't know is more important than what I do know. Anyway, please. So I hope you keep on saying nothing for the next, uh, uh, for the next minutes. Um, so your studio process, I understood that It, it got more intense in the last month, but your studio process didn't change because traveling doesn't make that much, um, isn't so important for your work, or did I get you wrong? Um, look, uh, you know, we are, uh, like anybody else, I love to travel and go to new places, but um, 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 keeping a studio practice going is a daily event. Um, And I feel that's important. Um, you know, one of the problems or one of the questions that perhaps artists get asked nowadays is how do you react to the current situation? Once again, I feel that without full and proper digestion, there's, there's no reaction to have. We're all dumbfounded. And maybe it's that dumbness, that, um, uh, if you like, unknowing. We're in a profound unknowing, but politically, psychologically, um, 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 aesthetically, etc. Um, and I think it's acknowledging unknowing that is um, um, the current reality and perhaps out of it some art will emerge we shall see yes That, we, we are very curious to to see yeah. so um yeah. i'm sure someone's asking later so i'm asking now does your sculpture that was created before uh, this um terrible situation um reflect the actual situation because it was it was finished now and you thought about the title and the color that changed yeah uh, are you talking, or, about, or don't, you're talking don't, about i'm talking about the sculpture in the pinacotech yes 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 go on, please but yes do you, you don't see a direct relation to the political and, and the situation of, of the course i do oliver of course i do so what what happened um I started with a work, or started with a, two ideas. I had two different ideas with the, the proposition of the space. I've long, for, for many, many years, made these you know, quite big inflated forms. So that was one idea, one kind of thing that emerged from a previous working process. Um, the other was related quite solidly related to a work I made many years ago called At the Edge of the World. The Edge of the World is a kind of cupola hanging, very similar in scale to Howl, in fact, hanging uh, from the ceiling, but it's a void form. It's a negative void form. It's, it's a deep, dark red, rather like this, um, you know, Elysian crimson red, my favorite color. Um, <laughs> the color I keep returning to, the color of blood and interiority, I believe. Anyway, um, and what happened in that work was that I feel that what I was doing was taking the color of the earth, of ground, of blood, and turning it into sky. So it hangs above you. Um, it's the only way, perhaps, when you've got a form like that, you know, you're standing here, um, to have a full horizon, 
and um, um, it's a dark, dark, ominous red sky. Now, I wondered to myself, I wondered in the process of working, and I must be clear, we made a model. Rather, you sent me a model of the Pinacateca space, and it's out of playing with it that this form began to emerge. Um, the opposite of the work at the edge of the world, meaning this is a full form. So I started at first with a much, much brighter red color. Um, uh, you know, it felt okay to start with. And then I began to wonder, what is it that I'm doing? The formal proposition is straightforward, to fill the space with this ovoid, yes, you're getting some pictures on it on the screen now, with this kind of ovoid form um, that has a similar construction in a way to this roof struss here, where you see in this picture, that's on the screen right now, you can see that there's a circular disc in the middle and then tangents that come off it. So we've used a very similar construction method in the making of, the, of this form. Anyway, um, so the form sits and pushes out. That's what I wanted, pushing it out against the columns that run from, so that's looking up at the form uh, from below um, and it's pushing out against the column. Here it is on the first floor, pushing out. So not massively pushing out, but pushing out enough to feel in tension with the building. Um, but to back to color. So I was wondering, what, what is it? Is it just a balloon? In a way, is it nothing? Is it pure ephemera? Or is it possible that um, it could have a, a solid presence? So, uh, toying with the title, you know, Marcel Duchamp said that the title of a work is another part of content or is the maker. It's almost like another object or another, another, another if you like, thing in the sculpture, uh, a physical presence. Um, so toying with the title, I went from all kinds of void ideas. Uh, at one time I had uh, uh, the Hebrew word klum, klum meaning nothing. Um, I wanted to go to, if you like, uh, esoteric uh, 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 position. But anyway, it felt clumsy. And, and at one point you even said to me that in German it didn't sound right. Um, so I then decided on the color and howl came to me. Howl meaning the cry, the dark cry in the night, the, the cry of a wolf, the thing that looks up. You know, the wolves do that. They look up and go, whoa, whoa, whatever it is. I can't do it, but there you go. This howl, if you like, in the darkness of the night. And I wondered if both politically, aesthetically, and otherwise, that was the right description of this work. That is to say, ephemera, because a howl is nothing. It's a sound that's here and gone. Um, ephemera and, if you like, makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up, does both things. Um, and then, of course, there is Allen Ginsberg's great, great poem called Howl, which is, um, um, if you like, a cry for the outsider. And it just felt, I thought, yes, every single thing seems to be pushing towards this as a possible way to think. Um, and then it confirmed for me that the color should get darker, that it might not let light through, that it becomes, if you like, a much more solid form. Um, and this sort of burgundy, purple, dark red um, felt to me to be the right thing to do. Okay, thanks, Anish. You, it was almost a lecture. You, you answered questions I didn't uh, even I, ask yet. So. <laughs> Let, let's, take a step, let's take a step back because I wonder, uh, we got used to video conferences, uh, video calls in the last month, but it, it must be a special situation for you. I mean, I'm, I'm showing you images of an artwork mm. you created mm. uh, and we are talking about it, but you, you haven't seen it yet in 
uh, on site. So how, how does that how does that oh. feel for you? What's what's your what are your reflections on that strange situation? Well, my first reaction to that is that I feel a little ashamed not to be there. To be honest with you, um, um, I feel a bit sad that I I, I can't be there, but. Um, um, I guess uh, I'm being very risk averse and saying that it's a risk that I don't want to take at the moment. Um, so forgive me for that. Um, but but here, here, there is the other side of it. You know, as artists, we do at some level conduct our educations in public, especially when you make work like this. There's no real way of rehearsing it. It is what it is. And you say, I, I dare to take the risk. There's, you, there's not the money or the time to rehearse it. You can't put it up and say, oh, I want to change it. No, it is what it is. Um, so it has a def definitive reality of its own. But don't forget that I have extensive models here in the studio. I have watched it um, very, very, very carefully over a good few months. So I know what it's going to do. And then, um, you know, from a different perspective, my dear um, Pete Lynch, and I must say, I must say, uh, David Walker, um, who actually put this thing together. We've, we've, of course, worked together a number of times. Um, and to a precision that is, as you said earlier, you know, down to the milliliter. Um, um, you know, that they have paid real deep attention to all, every little detail. And, you know, so, so I have a certain confidence that, that it's done as, as we planned for it to be. But I'm sad not to be there. Okay. So it's, uh, it's a great experience to, to, to speak with you about this piece this way. Um, let's start at the beginning once again, because I'd like to know... When we um, when we walk the building, what's uh, we want to get a bit closer to your working process. I mean, how would you describe that building, that rotunda, and what's the ch the challenge for finding the right form for for that space? And one more, uh, I mean, you worked in a lot of materials in steel and wax and pigments, fiberglass, so on. And how came the What's so specific about choosing the this PVC and and finding the form with it? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, look, it's oh, it's a hard one. Um, that space, the 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 rotunda, um, it's big. Um, it's public. Uh, needs. So there are some things you told me from the beginning. We need twenty-four hour a day public access, and the, the floor can't be touched. I did something you can put in the middle. We need three. So yeah, you know, all those things already set um, a certain agenda. Um, uh, the real, the truth of the matter is that for some long time now, years. I've uh, um, uh, come to this possibility while positives in the world, you know, all physical posit positive objects uh, have um, negative possibility. What do I mean by that? I mean voidity. I mean, um, existence and non-existence are like this with each other when it comes to um, not only our bodies, but also um, in our lives and ourselves, but also in, 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 in objects. Um, so um, that's something that I've come to and returned to and returned to. Now, weirdly here, this presents the possibility of the opposite, which is that the void of the building could be um, um, filled, could be not void, but of course it's also fantasy because in a way it's a balloon, you know, it's a, it's a, um, uh, something filled with air. Gibt es von Ihrer Seite Fragen, die ich mir zwischendurch merken und ihm stellen kann? 
Größe. Das kann ich Ihnen sagen, äh, knapp 22 Meter Durchmesser, größte Breite, Höhe 14 Meter. Is that better? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we're here again. Thank you. Okay, here we are. Sorry yeah. about that. Don't yeah. know what happened. No, um, I'm sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay. I know we. Uh, I don't know where we you, have you. We have image and voice again. So. Yes. Good. Um, good. What What a pity. You. Yeah. Uh, it was fascinating to hear your reflections. So, um, going back again to the production process, um, it was also new for me that there's a bit, a big part of engineering in that in that work. Uh, there's an artistic part and an engineering part, mm -hmm. and you're working together with the best specialists mm -hmm. for this fabric. And mm -hmm. how how do you how would you describe your interaction between engineering and and artistic designing? Or, Mm. Is there mm. um, um, yeah. a I mean, close relation, it, it, or how how do you describe this this interaction? Um, over the years, I've made lots of objects that require um, very precise um, specifications. So, you know, for example, if we're making a stainless steel. If, if I'm casting something in stainless steel or fabricating something in stainless steel. Um, because I'm working with concave um, um, surfaces, concavity magnifies everything. It makes it much bigger. You know, positive form, uh, convexity reduces the image. Concavity magnifies it. So we have learned here at the studio how to work not to usual... Um, um, engineering specifications, which could be minus you know one or two millimeters. No, here we have to work to microns. Otherwise, it just you get a ripple in the surface; it doesn't work. So we've learned over the years how to, with great fabricators and and Pete's Pete, my dear Pete Lynch's huge attention. Um, we've learned how to really concentrate. So with these fabric pieces, this is the fourth one, um, or is, it, is there more, four, four or five, whatever it is, um, that I've made over the years. Um, um, David Walker and his team have, David Walker from Velotex, who actually made it, um, and his team have a, a, a group of engineers, and we have understood that the tolerances that are allowed. Look, I'm looking for a perfect oval form inflated into this space so that it hovers exactly 2.8 meters off the ground um, i've forgotten the distance from the ceiling etc so it's and it does you know with the pillars there it does this little i don't want to bulging out like this so it's very very precise and we've learned how to tailor these objects um, so the, the seams are cut and they are heat welded onto each other like that. Um, um, so that we end up with precision. No, there's a certain rules, no wrinkles. I don't want to see the edges, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So very, very precise, rather tough um, um, parameters. But without them, you end up with something that looks almost right. And almost right is not good enough. Um, especially when the proposition is as, as if you like, straightforward as, as, as this. So it's got to be done. It's got to be done just so. And I think that is part of our the studio process. It's where once the idea is set, there it is, we're going to do it now. How to work it deeply work it to get just that result, something nearly that result, that neurotic as hell, of course. So the, the sound is, is getting poorer again, but um, oh, we are running no. out of time slowly. But I'd like to ask you one question by the, um, by the online audience from the live stream. It says... Please. Does the color also reflect female connotations? 
menstruation, uterus, birth. I'm just reading it from the screen. So <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes is the answer. So, you know, much of my work um, is especially, I mean, from the very beginning, has been obsessed with a particular idea. The idea is that, and you forgive me for a little divergence, but the idea is that culture, as it's in, in its origins, in the beginning of human time, culture is feminine. It is not, as we think, masculine. The gods, the gods of the beginning were gods of menstruation, blood pouring out, um, blood and the earth, horizontal. In other words, if we to believe um, the anthropological story, then women menstruated together because they lived together. This gave them power and, you know, power, if you like, in, in society, joined up Marxist power, I would dare to say. Um, and um, in power, if you like, also in denial. But men have no access to blood. So we invent circumcision, we do a bit of hunting, and we are trying to acquire <laughs> blood. But actually, we have no access to blood. Um, so what do men do? Men re then, later in culture, men, you know, one might imagine the fantasy is that these early women danced together, covered their bodies in red ochre in order to hide their menstruation. If you like, turned into, um, 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 I'm going to use the word, goddesses of culture. Um, men had no access. So what do men do later on? They turn all the gods blue. They all, all the gods live in the sky. They don't die and they don't have any blood. You know, Christ, of course, has a little cut in his side as an attempt. I'm saying not enough. So I truly and deeply believe that this is vital. I mean, what we do is take the horizontality of femininity and turn it into the verticality of blue masculinity. Um, and I feel it is time now, passionately, you can hear that I'm deeply passionate about this, it's time that we return to feminine, horizontal, red, maternal origin, which is both fierce and rah, it's both, you know, gives with this hand and takes with that hand. She's the goddess of life and death, if you like. Um, and she bleeds and she's full of bleh. She's abject and she's, you know, all of that goes. So, so um, um, this is not some nice, I will save you male God, something else. Anyway, so, so yes, that, the piece, that's, the that's a fundamental that's a Absolutely. fundamental statement. So Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and forgive me for my passion, but I care about it hugely. Okay. So in these I, weird I, times, in these weird times, let me say one more sentence, Oliver. Please. Yes, of course. In these weird times, it's as if men are not allowed to talk about female things, but I don't believe that's right. Okay. I don't believe that that is the right way to think. Anyway. Please. I don't believe you have nothing to say anymore, but... Uh, <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> let's let's um, give uh, the uh, media representatives in this room the chance to, to pose uh, one or two last questions. Sie können die Frage auch auf Deutsch stellen, wenn Sie mögen, dann übersetzen wir sie. ask much about your work because I haven't seen it yet. But I wonder, at the beginning of your conversation, you mentioned your ideas coming to you, and your, probably mm. somehow your daily routine. So I wonder about this pro process. You might comment on that. Thank you. The ideas, how they coming, so like the process and your daily routine in studio. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, have I understood this correctly? You're asking me about my daily routine and about where and how ideas emerge. Is that correct? Yes. Is that correct? Or yes, is that, that's, is it, that's yeah. correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I try to have a practice. 
So it's, you know, practice meaning in a very almost religious sense. I do the same thing every day, go to the studio um, at the more or less the same time and have a real, if you like, engaged practice. Um, um, inevitably, there's stuff in my head. Um, my Part of my job is, if you like, the de-schooling of myself, meaning how do I do what I don't know how to do? How do I risk doing what might be a total failure, um, et cetera, et cetera. One just has to keep, that's just practice. That's just do, 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 do. Don't think, do, is what I say to myself. Um, in Zen, there's a wonderful phrase which says, first idea, best idea. Go for it, in other words. Um, meaning don't let yourself get in the way in as far as it's possible. It's a fiction, of course, at one level. And in that process of working, things emerge. Now, I spent uh, 25 years in psychoanalysis. So you go into your analyst's room, you lie on the bed, and you say, blah, 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 blah. there's all the things that are there to say for 50 minutes. Um, and in time, the strange reality is that the same things get said again and again and again. And that one, if you like, cyclically returns to the same questions. So it is, I say, in the studio. And that's what Barnett Newman called content. Not meaning, content. Meaning the deep thing that lies, if you like, within the work. So I'm saying one of them, for me, that's emerged is this question of empty and full, void and full. The other one is um, interiority, blood and beginning. Um, you know, science is very good at questions about consciousness. No, in fact, sorry, I mean the opposite. Science is very bad, good at many things, but bad at consciousness. It doesn't tell us, can't tell us there's no work hardly. A lot of people trying to do the work, but of what consciousness is, artists can deal with this strange phenomena, which is consciousness. Where do we come from? Where do we go? Where were we before we were born? And where do we go after we, we die? What is this weird phenomena that we call um, being alive? Um, I mean, psychically. So I think speculations there emerge, they emerge, they emerge, and one has to have the courage to let them emerge. Are there emerging other questions? <laughs> Does your concept, uh, just, uh, with the blood and the feminism, does anything has to do with uh, that you're coming from India? Do okay. you understand the question, Anish? Yes, I do. Okay. Yes, I do. Um, look, I'm Indian, but, but I'm not an Indian artist. I'm not interested in it. I'm not, it is not the problem. So I'm going to dare to put my foot with this question into um, the whole Black Lives Matter question. Museums all over the world, I'm going to say, you know, uh, museums all over the world, let's start with the Museum of Modern Art reopening in New York. Um, what they did at the reopening in New York was to have rooms and rooms and rooms. You walk into the museum on the ground floor, rooms and rooms. I don't know how many rooms of art from everywhere, every single continent. Um, you know, Indian artists, African artists, Chinese artists, and everybody else included. Um, um, room after room, works hung like this next to each other, on top of each other, etc. A disgrace, according to me. And then you walk into one room in which the great master, Richard Serra, has a room to himself. Excuse me. Uh, you'll forgive my next profanity, but fuck you, Moma. No way. No way. So we have to, we have to claim, we artists, especially us artists from elsewhere, have to claim, if you like, um, the non-linear um, connection with all of our cultures. We cannot look at German artists and say, oh, it's just German stuff. 
What crap? <laughs> so uh, forgive me for being so direct, but it is not, if you like, there are obviously Indian roots, just like Picasso had Spanish roots and French ones. Um, there are obviously Indian roots, but it's not enough. So one has to look to, especially in this post, you know, if you like this postmodern age, when it is, if you like, the age of the individual, you cannot attribute creativity to the background culture. Oh, I say, oh, it's all that Indian stuff. So we have to resist that massively. And our institutions, um, Pinacoteca included, my dear Oliver, but all of the institutions have to take this very complicated subject um, on in a serious way. I mean, I don't propose that it's a, there are easy answers, but um, if you like cosmopolitanism today, isn't just a matter of going on a, on a holiday to Africa and say, oh, yeah, African stuff looks like that. No. We have to ask much more questions, deep questions, like, for example, what is the African, what does it mean in African aesthetics to talk about the sublime? I have no idea. What does it mean? Um, how different are Chinese sublime ideas from European ones? Um, and we could go on and on and on and on and on. So, you know, if we think of ourselves as cosmopolitan beings, creators, workers, makers, thinkers, then we have to model our thinking, our, our knowledge, our reading, our openness um, in different ways. Difficult, difficult problems that I, I, I accept there are no easy answers. So thank you. Anish. In a very I mean, way, I've answered your question, I hope. Yeah, it, listening to you is, is like going on a roller coaster, which is really fascinating. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we touched on, on many topics and you gave us some exercises for this museum for the future. We are working on them. And when you come to Munich, we'll show you the results. Uh, we don't have a Richard Serra gallery, by the way. Um, no, 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 bless. <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid we have to, to, to interrupt here, but only to invite you to come to Munich and, and continue this, um, this talk, this lecture. And um, I would like to thank you from the bottom of my heart for this breathtaking and electrifying sculpture. Uh, and I thank everyone for taking part in this media conference, uh, to our live stream audience, and, and first and foremost to you, Anish, for for answering the questions and for touching so many topics and for uh, helping us to understand your work and the philosophical, cultural context of it better than we did before. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Goodbye. Thank you, Oliver. Thank you all. Namaste. Thank you all. Thank you.